there are other questions on that one. The other one is uh, recreational vehicles and trailers. So for the first thing we did, we is, we've actually, yes. Could you go back, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a regulated day that businesses get picked up on? So what I'm thinking of is, take that. If everybody negotiates their own contract, how do you know whose garbage container is what? So how would you, how would, how would Larry enforce it? Right, we would, that's a great question. We'd have to find out what the day is. Um, I believe it's Thursday right now for- but We do have a consistent day oh, for yeah. downtown. For the, well, for the- For, for the, the businesses. Unless they chose to contract with someone different, which they could. Okay. Um, that is consistent as long as they stay with their, their current company. Uh, the next one, uh, so recreational vehicles and trailers. Um, the way the ordinance is right now, it doesn't define recreational vehicles in a way that's consistent with the state statute. It just kind of lists um, a bunch of different, uh, it lists camping trailers, fifth wheel trailers, motor homes, travel trailers, truck camp, it lists them all in this kind of litany. Um, and it's, it's hard, uh, so, so that was one thing that's not very clear. So we thought let's define it as the state statute defines a recreational vehicle. And then secondly, uh, right now there's, there's an issue, and Larry especially sees it in, in, the, in the field, where uh, you, right now you can park a motor home or rec a recreational vehicle on the street in a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood, as big as you want. Can you not also now? That's right. So when you write this code, do you really mean to only limit it in residential, or wouldn't you also want to have some way to control it on commercial streets as well? Potentially, as we, we just haven't seen it being an issue. Um, on no, I, I know, I'm just yeah. forethought. Sure. I mean, that's something that... Might be something we want to write in there. Yep. It could, uh, that, that could be a, uh, something to look at as well, yeah. Um, so what, what this, you're right, what this would do is, is specifically for res the residential areas. Um, and it would also in incorporate trailers. There's a situation right now where in, um, I believe it's the Oaks, um, <laughs> where there's a, believe it or not, there's actually a, a car transport trailer that falls just below the threshold of a commercial vehicle when it's disconnected from the truck because it's no longer uh, 10,000 pounds, which is what the UDO requires. So the loophole is just disconnect it and you can have it there on the street. Um, so that's something we've seen in, again, res the residential areas as being a, a concern, so. But I believe that's all. Uh, yeah. So the 12 hours, that allows for moving trucks and things like that, which is where that's coming from. Right. Delivery, routine, yeah. anything. And this doesn't preclude someone from being able to have a recreational vehicle. Um, the code does allow for you to have a recreational vehicle on your private property. Um, so that this is, right. Or on your lot somewhere. Yeah. You just can't live in it, which we also have some concerns that arise from time to time. The proposed effective dates would again be a little bit more than a month out so that there would be time for notification, education. Are there any questions on, on those? So a couple questions. Mm -hmm. So 50, 75, 100, that seems cheaper. Why wouldn't I just take the ticket and leave it there? Because I know if the town rule is 50 bucks. I, I know what it costs to get it removed out of a out of our neighborhood parking lot. You're going to pay 300 bucks. So the risk there, okay, we will abide by the rule. Um, we've seen an uptick in 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 communities where there's enough discretionary money in their pocket that fifty dollars. I, you know, I don't need to clean the clubhouse. We'll just let you keep my my deposit. 
and I'm, I'm a little bit worried that that 50, 75, 100, that combined over the course of a year isn't as much as one towing. So I, that's why I'm, yeah. I'd like you to understand what you're thinking thinking is there. So I can confirm um, I just this is an existing fine. It's using section it's 10 section 1099 out of the existing code so I could look it up pretty pretty quickly here but um, I believe after that hundred dollars each day is a new violation so it actually becomes a hundred dollars a day after you hit those three. So it's a that would actually add up to a more significant amount. Um, but I'd have to I'd have to confirm that. Um, then the other, I, I'm curious as to what the board feels in terms of um, do you feel it should be extended to all streets and it, uh, since it was brought up and then contrast that, what's the risk with that? Um, so I don't know what the rest of the board feels about that. Um, you can wait and hear what the rest of the board feels first, Kurt, because you uh, thoughts, um, anything? You have an, uh, another perspective from another town that no no I, I was just I'm just I'm also just trying to think of why they should be allowed on other streets yeah and I, and I, I don't really have um, don't see I don't I don't see why prohibiting them on on the other streets would be problematic so good any other questions for Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Hubert. Potential small transportation improvement projects. Good afternoon, Mayor. And I, I just want to just do a little preamble here and compliment Ms. Mr. Hubert for the great job he did stepping in for Mr. Rory on a very tough project, the uh, great crossing uh, uh, from uh, Collins Road down to Helms Road. We had 21 days to turn that around, and in the middle of that, uh, Dennis was leaving, and, and Matt had to take that on, work with South Carolina DOT, the Rail Division, Union County, Mineral Springs, and Waxhaw, and I just compliment you on the job well done, and it was, it, was reinforced at the CRTPO meeting when the chairman paused the meeting and, and complimented uh, on the collaboration that was shown. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. So today um, I want to talk about maybe the first fruit of our labor in, in realizing uh, the funding we've get, gotten from the uh, vehicle fee. And I want to talk about top three items we, we might be able to, to realize to start out that process. So in the recent survey we had of town residents, uh, traffic transportation issues were identified as a, as a major concern for residents. In order to address that concern, we acted the vehicle fee and, um, and we funded $300,000 a year toward the, the kinds of projects that, that normally the state doesn't uh, see on the radar. And this, these funds wouldn't encumber the funds that we use for our ongoing annual street maintenance. Uh, so with this in mind, we compiled a short list of, of three out of 10 that we considered initially to bring forward for, for review and discussion. Uh, those top three in the order of priority is, as I see them are the installation of a less turn lane on Kensington Drive and Morehouse Drive intersection realignment at Pine Oak Road and Waxhaw Marvin Road, and then finally the Howie Mine sidewalk replacement or upgrade. So as we go into more detail on each of those alternatives, um, the Kensington Drive turn lane is really to help see the vision of that east-west connector value uh, to, to increase the, the capacity uh, of that corridor. Estimated cost is about $250,000 uh, rough beginning estimate. The benefits of that, uh, it does address the town maintained street. It is 
is bordered by two developments we believe are receptive to right-of-way requests that are typically slow down or add increased cost to, to projects we're seeing, that being Quellen and Lindsay Meadows. The design initially was already completed as part of the overall Kensington Drive improvement project, which had to be shelved because of cost and, and the bridge being too low to really do anything about. Um, and additionally, it has potential to be completed in some arrangement in conjunction with Lindsay Meadows construction when they do their turn lane. Um, maybe we use their contractor as well and just do a payment and try and get some efficiency and certainly we don't interrupt that area for two different projects. Um, basically the con is it's in it's localized only to that one part of town. Uh, I don't know that all the rest really avoid that condition but certainly that's that's something to be taken into account. So if we look at but it, it's but it's also a uh, a road the traffic count at times rivals 16 as well, correct? Absolutely. If you're talking about future volumes and uh, versus other areas of town, this is certainly an item where we're going to see increased traffic. Uh, absolutely. And just a picture of it now, there is a right turn lane in coming uh, westbound, but there is no left turn, so right now traffic would stack up behind anybody trying to turn in if they don't have that opportunity. This is just an excerpt of the plan sheet from the original Kensington Drive that shows uh, the amount of due diligence that's already been done. We would just have to um, do additional design to make it coincide with the Lindsay Meadows lane improvements out there are the only additional design costs that, that should be encumbered. So then if we move on to alternative two, which is Pine Oak, Waxhaw Marvin intersection, um, it's to eliminate the poor angle of approach that those streets currently have um, to improve the safety specifically, get it up to, to current design standards. Estimated cost is 175. I think that number is probably low based on some of the numbers we're currently getting. I would say for comparison purposes, just assume these projects are all more or less about the same cost. Um, and we'll certainly be able to have more detailed information as we put more, more time into the planning. Again, pros for this one. It's because of the, the angle you, that you have, it's a, it's a safety concern. And DOT, even though it's two DOT roads, um, they're not really going to see it on their radar until there is a crash with injury or, or heaven forbid, a, a fatality. So this is so, trying to get out front of those kinds of conditions because we can tell the future need is, is to have a, a standard intersection there. Another reason is, is cost of right-of-way acquisitions are always going to be lowest at the present time. Um, and then if, if that's identified as, as good commercial property, if something gets developed before we can get there, we might not, it might not be feasible on cost at all. The cons, again, um, they would be using these funds on state-maintained streets, which is not ideal, but under the circumstances, it, it, it might be warranted. Uh, and then timing. We, uh, we're in the middle or at the end of the Waxhaw Marvin Corridor study, so this information has not really been taken into account in, the, in that study. So there might be some, um, some information that comes out of that that helps inform this one as well. And then here, you just, a, just a quick rundown of, of the existing condition where the intersection, you have to, you, you just have bad sight distance and uh, you, you're kind of taking a chance, certainly at night. Uh, it's very concerned, disconcerting when you want to be this person pulling out into Waxhaw Marvin, and it's only going to get worse as these traffic volumes increase. Again, what they would do is they would probably have to get most of this parcel um, and put a connection straight across that has better 90 degree angle approaches to each, and then connect in Sunbonnet Lane to then join up over here and just eliminate that altogether. The third alternative is the Howie Mine sidewalk upgrade, uh, specifically to address the poor condition and functionality, the safety of the current sidewalk, which serves the residents, and it also is a hazard to the vehicle traffic because there's no gutter. It's just a sharp edge at, the, uh, at the, where the sidewalk begins and the pavement ends. This would be specifically between North Providence and Curitan Street. Estimated cost based on uh, previous efforts to, to have this work done is, is $300,000. Uh, the 
benefits. It addresses a safety issue that affects both the pedestrians and the vehicles. We, we, we receive numerous complaints throughout any, any year on both sides of this, uh, whether you're walking it or whether you're driving it. It does serve an area of town where development's really not an option to help mitigate this condition where we would think someone could come in and help kind of do these as a part of their development. Um, we don't see that on the horizon. Again, we've, we've tried to secure grants to help uh, facilitate this project and it has not qualified and, and currently we're not aware that then it will qualify in the near future unless some new grants that have different parameters come up on the horizon. Was this the sidewalk from the CDBG grant last year? That right, right. Okay. We did a survey study and we, we had to do a, a, um, a survey of, of, of levels of um, income mm -hmm. and we just couldn't get any response in any way that, that helped kind of provide that documentation for HUD. Yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it's difficult because there are parameters. You can't really tell them exactly what the survey is about. You just kind of, on good faith, are, are kind of asking, would you mind answering some questions? And these questions are specifically related to income. And so it's not set up for success the way you have to go through it. Uh, we did everything we could in terms of getting information out to the community to the degree we were permitted. Uh, I think Kurt even went door to door in some situations to try and facilitate that process and we still could not um, provide the numbers that needed to meet the goals of the uh, of the grant. So without that data you couldn't get it. Right, without being able to support that it, it really uh, fell, fell below their ability to to provide that. Okay. That's sad. And the cons here, um, again it's using town funds to improve a state maintained road but Traditionally, DOT doesn't really do sidewalk projects as a matter of course, so I wouldn't really expect that they'd come in anytime soon and do that anyway, so that kind of washes. Unless they were doing the whole road. Basically. Right, right. If they, if they came in and redid the corridor, yeah. uh, if there was a need, but I don't think the number... That's not going to happen for a while. Right. Right. So here are just a couple of examples of the existing conditions where some areas the sidewalk is just sunken and cracked. Um, some areas it's been paved over so much there's not really a good delineation between the road and the sidewalk. Some areas there's, and I can't even explain why, it's almost 11 inches of sidewalk in some areas. And none of those are ideal. Um, it puts pedestrians very close to the road. There's no gutter. This last one kind of shows where we've added uh, a section of sidewalk beyond this area, and you can see the difference it makes in safety and uh, just the aesthetics of it all. And so uh, I think you can also see the benefits we could, we could gain if we selected this project. So again, uh, my recommendation, or the staff's that is, is, is that we begin with Kensington Drive, um, and generally that's because of the timing involved, I think we can we can realize the savings with trying to partner with uh, Lindsay Meadows in trying to get this done. Should there be, uh, we find out that there are more funds available. When we cost this out and, and realize any savings with any of the projects, we'd certainly come back to you guys and, and talk about options uh, moving forward in this year and or future years. Can I ask you when? Uh, you said the Waxhaw Marvin Corridor study is coming back soon. When? when yeah, um, it's data? supposed to be done by August was the original date, and I think we are on target for that. So very shortly we should okay. um, get some level of information that might help guide this. Thank you. So the, um, currently there is, uh, I guess it's repaving on Pine Oak right now? I know they were going to do shoulder work. Shoulder work? It's reconstruction, basically, on a section over to Waxhaw Marvin Road. But there was no, there's no way to really tie in with the project, because that's a NCDOT project, right? right? But there was no way for us to tie this Pine Oak project. Right. That was a, that's just a standard maintenance um, funding that they're using, and, and they've, uh, they've never expressed to us any future desire to do anything related to that intersection at this time. And we certainly didn't want in any way to slow that down because that work needed to be done. So it'll be beneficial. And so anything that they do to the far end of Pine Oak 
can be used as that service drive for future house connections. So it really won't be, there'll be some small section that would go away ultimately, but that would occur anyway. So. Uh, my personal preference would be to start at Pine Oak because of the safety issues, the fact that you could have cars crashing into cars. However, there are a couple qualifiers that I'd like to ask you about. Uh, when I drive through there, not only is it the angle at which the roads intersect, but is the height of the road. Are you planning to reduce that hump in Waxhaw Marvin to add to the site distance? Right, that would have to certainly have be part of the process when, when the design, they're gonna take into account site distance on, on both approaches. And, and if there is, if it doesn't meet current standards, then they will have to be uh, accounted for in the, in the costs as well as the design to, to make sure it meets the standards we, we now have. How long do you think it would take you to get plans for that intersection improvement done to where you could get going on it? Yeah, in this market, it's probably uh, longer than, than normal um, just because it's so hot trying to get somebody right out of the gate, but uh, in probably six months to a year to get the survey done, get plans initiated and then you know we got to go hand in hand with DOT so that drags it out but certainly within a year we should see something that that uh, so basically by the time you're ready we'll be into the next budget cycle likely likely was so because so, we're so green on this one so if you just put it in a practical sense you can't get to this intersection at Pine Oak Road before the next budget cycle anyway probably not okay. uh, we would encumber you know just the design and, and possibly right of way acquisition costs and then move on to a different year for the actual construction costs. I think the key thing Matt just said was if if there would be an ability to have enough preliminary design to have some right of way conversation then that might be a fruitful approach but um, because we know property that will be impacted so that that might be an opportunity if we have some additional dollars in this year to move that part of it forward right but I think from what the practical standpoint the number one project is the ripest and I'll use that term um, and the number two project is probably the second most and then they go in that, that order as far as project delivery I, I think the last one that Matt mentioned is sidewalk again you're talking about multiple properties with right-of-way acquisition or right-of-way donation or right-of-way you know, impact so one that's easiest in, in a lot of ways is the one that deals with the fewest property owners. And so with Quellen and with Lindsay Meadows, hopefully that process would be a little bit quicker and a little bit smoother than having to interact with multiple properties that might not be crazy about the projects. Well, and there's a lot of piece parts coming together on Kensington as well right. over the next couple of months. The, which the, the other part of it, in my mind, Howie Mine is the second one from a safety issue, but again, there's some qualifiers, and with the recent success with CRTPO, CSX, NCDOT, South Carolina, et cetera, it sounds like you're probably qualified to go ahead and take on the people that live along Howie Mine Road and see if we can do better with a grant approach as part of the strategy toward getting that done. I, I can tell you from a, an NCDOT standpoint, there's no grant eligibility coming up for two years. We're in the, the two-year scoring period right now, and so that process will start next fall for grants to be awarded in, what year are we in, 2018, 2020. That's just, they, they go on a two-year cycle. I mean, as an example, we, you know, I'm gonna update later on this evening, we're, we're on the, we may be on the receiving end of a grant that started in 2017 and it's 20, you know, 2018. It actually started in 2016 and that's just coming to an end. Right. Um, there's a lot of course correction going on because the federal government just passed a revised budget and so now they're moving money around from funds to make sure we don't lose money as well. So um, the focus is not on um, initiating new grants as much as it is trying to make sure that what we have 
gets allocated properly in the right bucket so we don't lose it. Um, and I would add, we're kind of learning just through the first two we're administering now that the cost of grants are expensive. We pay money to get that money. And if you're talking under a half million dollars, maybe even more, it's almost worth it to find a different way because the the requirements for right-of-way acquisition, the higher standard of care to meet federal guidelines, um, the cost of construction because the reporting is so uh, encumbersome to um, the, the contractor, everything gets inflated to where it, it almost, in, in costs in time and money, it, it, we're finding it's, it's really not worth it in the, in, for these smaller pro type projects. Um, I, when Dennis presented 10 projects I think a couple months ago, um, how did you come up with these three? Was it based on the most shovel ready, the most yeah, I think, um, um, safety issues? It was, a, it was a kind of a, a higher level um, comparison. A lot of those projects were specifically DOT. And, and it just seemed uh, not in our interest to spend our, our money in specifically on DOT's um, rights away. A lot of those are subject to having development kind of help facilitate those improvements as well. Um, and then certainly the ones associated with safety were brought to the forefront. And then the timeliness uh, specifically to Kensington was was a real factor in, in where it fall out, fell out in the, in the scheme of those. And additionally, what I would say is that the, the board certainly needs to have a discussion about those top 10 at some point. But what we wanted to do really is jumpstart that planning process and that delivery process with one or more projects to get something going and not spend a lot of time trying to get to a final 10 or 12 list. But let's pick something and get going on it. So that was kind of my charge to our engineering staff is to let's look at what, what is most practical to deliver that does have safety benefits, that does have congestion mitigation that we can get going and, and show some progress on and have a high success rate and, and, and good delivery. Um, we are wanting to have that broader discussion with the board to say, are there any other projects that are that are in addition to the 10 that were talked about that we need to add to that list? Is there one of the 10 that you want to take off the list and say, no, we're not interested in doing that? Um, that's a discussion we really do need to have. Uh, but we wanted to go ahead and get this to you today. We're in the first month of the year. We want to show some progress and get going on it and, and get one underway. I think we also need to make sure we're cognizant of whether we decide to do one or two or three or none or any of these. If we, if we pick a DOT road, there, we set a precedent towards DOT that if they ignore us long enough, we'll take care of it. I mean, it, we could be setting that precedent in some minds. So we have to be cognizant if that's a risk we're willing to take, rather than trying, again, to leverage them for some more money on their own roads. Just, it's something to consider in your calculations. One thing, Matt, that may help, um, not today, you know, sometime in the future, I think it would help if you came back and explained to the full board the difference between maintenance funding, spot safety, because some of these things just come up and, and you know, Pine Oak, that's a maintained road. That doesn't go on the project list. It would never come remotely close to qualifying for a project on the regional transportation just because of everything above it and, and how they score, because that's data driven. Likewise, um, Kensington would never make it, but it did qualify for the funding based upon the hard work you guys did to get that recognized as a critical road from a state and a federal point of view in terms of connecting 521 um, and up. Um, I mean, as they presented last week, it's Newtown, 75, and Kensington. Those are your connector roads now. That's the new picture of the region, which in my mind raises my antenna to okay what what are we doing there and how do we progress that and um because that is i mean if they're recognizing and willing to give us some funds because of that 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 raises the bar or not the bar but raises the attention on that significantly and then we're going to vote later on on what's going to happen with that intersection uh, tonight so yeah, a lot that, of activity that, going on there. Sure, and that's certainly something we can do because the way uh, 
uh, DOT does things is, is very confusing. They have a lot of layers, and uh, so we can certainly take a look at that and try and break it down for you in the future. And, with, and, and I'm not being critical of anybody. With, with what happened with the three roundabouts, now down to the two roundabouts, and nobody knows what the heck's going on out there and how it happened, I think clearing the air and just letting us, helping us understand it would be, would be helpful. Greg, I think he's... Uh, to Commissioner Lee's uh, point, I, I think it is an important thing to, dis to, to discuss and have a philosophy of is the town willing to make investment on state roads. Um, th there has been a major change in North Carolina as far as the way the DOT approaches town investment. And there used to be, and I, I remember sitting in the Secretary of Transportation's office one time and, and he said, you can't buy a project. And that was because the Secretary of Transportation was from the eastern part of the state. And so the philosophy back, back then was Charlotte area communities that are wealthy can't buy projects. And so that was the mindset that they had. And understandably, that it could be a philosophy. The shift in the administrations over the years became now projects are data driven. Soaring is data driven. And one of the reasons that we score well sometimes is if we bring additional dollars to the table. So there is now an acknowledgement that we're looking for partners. That discussion is happening at the federal level. I don't know how much um, everybody watches that, but the, the infra infrastructure investment, when you listen to what's actually being said, is we'll put a couple dollars on the table and we want the locals to put four dollars on the table. So that's the, the, the thought process at the federal level. But the state level is genuinely interested in finding partners and leveraging dollars. And so that is a healthy, good discussion for the town board to have is what is your philosophy as, as far as infrastructure investment? Um, to, to elaborate a little bit more, the problems are mainly, let me restate that, the big problems are mainly on state roads. We, we do have problems problems without a doubt on town roads that we need to address but the ones that impact the most traffic on a daily basis with the exception of Kensington which we own um, are going to be on those state roads uh, the, the, the point I would make too about the uh, Waxhaw Marvin Road from a timing standpoint we're going to get the study back and it's going to be in this window over the next couple months and then we'll be able to better have that information to, to look at that topography issue which is pretty bad um, I was there today and just noticed it again that as you're turning left if you head to southbound on Waxwell Marvin and you turn left on Pine Oak there's a hill and a dip and if you don't see a car coming at 55 it could be an issue so it's, it is really it is a safety hazard um, and so I'll be interested to see what the Waxwell Marvin study comes back and recommends there the possibility they might come up with some sort of other idea uh, other than just the button hook that we're thinking about but that other idea would most likely be more expensive if it was something else is there Matt. is there any data on uh, from the police department of incidents at that intersection or on how we mine uh, yeah I have, I'm not aware that there is okay that's what I was going to ask. My concern is I travel that road all the time, and it's dangerous. I think there was a wreck this weekend. Friday or Saturday, there was a pretty bad accident there. Um, so there's no uh, crash data as far as the town or the police department of how many we've had there. I see a lot of near misses there quite often. Right. Okay. And well, certainly something I could follow up on. I just want to clarify with Chief. I think both town police department and the county have gotten very rigorous in making sure that they enter the crash data in the location. And that does get picked up by DOT if it's a DOT mm -hmm. road. Yeah, okay. Interesting to see those numbers. <coughs> Thank you. I think the other scary part about Pine Oak and uh, Waxhaw Marvin, Saturday and Sunday with the bikers, with that dip, you can't see, see them at all. Um, and usually there's somebody driving in the opposite lane trying to pass the biker, so you you don't know where the heck you're going to go sometimes. I mean, that gets a little scary there. So, Any other questions for Matt? Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Okay, we're going to do a couple of work plan presentations by some boards and committees. First up, uh, Kelly. And I want to preface uh, this by saying that uh, uh, the town board has uh, is in the process of building out a, a, a series of work sessions so we can get a lot of work done. And first up, when we take the boards and committees, we're going to be discussing as a whole all the work plans and, and, and the like. So. Um, what feedback you don't get today, just wait a week or two. You'll get a lot more, okay? <laughs> Very good. So, Very good. So we good thank you for making you. time yes, to join us thank today. Thank you. I'm Kelly Lang Ramirez, the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. And let's see. All right, I'm going to review our four main goals for our work plan this year. Um, the first being uh, the facade improvement program, which is probably one that you're most familiar with. Um, the goal of that program is economic development, and the grants are to encourage investment of repair and maintenance of the downtown commercial buildings as well as private residences. Um, and we are focusing on a historic period of significance of 1888 through 1941. Um, the two main reasons why we feel this um, grant is important is that one, historic buildings are often rather expensive to keep up, more so than newer buildings. Um, it could be due to the historic um, character of it in, in different structures or the type of material that's used, et cetera. Um, and then secondly, um, our promotion of being able to help uh, property owners preserve that historic character of their buildings um, is to really preserve the unique character of downtown Waxhaw. So we feel that's very near and dear to our heart, that particular unique character that draws people to um, Waxhaw. So throughout the year, um, there is always an annual workshop uh, to educate the public on the facade improvement program, to discuss what the grants you know, can cover and the process itself. Um, also, we go through and update and refine that grant application process annually along with the Board of Commissioners. Um, and we also assist the applicants from beginning to end if needed, um, or particularly if they're running across some construction snafus and we wanna make sure everything's keeping with what was approved in the grant application, as well as often, probably more often, it's a timeline issue, as everyone knows, if they've done any home or building improvements, things can get delayed, unforeseen you know, issues that come up. So we work with them with extensions or whatnot to keep everything in compliance. And goal two is our oral history project. And that started just a few years ago in 2015. Um, the intent is to have it be an ongoing project. And we hope to have begin really quite a, a collection of videotaped histories, um, different residents you know, accounting their memories and stories of families, friends, neighbors, um, just events that have happened in the town. We'd like to get those um, recorded. And so this year our goal is to have four of those oral histories recorded. Um, that's not so easy to do, so we do plan to reach out to residents um, and make that interview process as user-friendly or comfortable as possible. Um, so we try to understand what might make them more comfortable in giving a, a recording of that account. Um, and then once those videos are um, recorded, we will publicly have those available on the town's YouTube channel. And goals three and four. Number three relates to public education outreach and social media. So throughout the year, the commission will contribute either information or written articles um, to town communications, the Village News, and Tri W publication. We will also establish a social media presence and update the Historic Preservation Commission's page on the town website, as well as participate in any community festivals, events, and try to give out, um, just educate the public on historic preservation in general in our commission specifically. Goal number four is the historic landmark designation. And we will pursue landmark designation for historic buildings and structures that are within the National <coughs> Historic District in Waxhaw. We will also help educate and assist those historic property owners as they go through the designation process or try to maintain status. And Lastly, we have a few other business items that we take care of throughout the year. 
um, we do review and consider the certificates of appropriateness of those local landmarks to ensure that work done on the designated landmark is appropriate to the special character of the landmark. So we're really focusing on that special character. Um, we also have training for our Historic Preservation Commission members. We do that through workshops, field uh, trips, possibly joint trainings with Main Street Committee or other committees where it's relevant and we have crossover. And then lastly, we go through and update any of our working documents. That could include the rules and procedures, historic landmark guidelines, facade improvement, program application, and various brochures or information to make sure that's current and accurate. So, any questions or feedback at this time? I have questions. Sure. Um, what exactly does the historic landmark designation do? Is it just, just to put a plaque so that people know the history, or is there any protection of that property for the future, or? There is protection in that it also, um, and I am not the expert on that exact, Sorry. so I apologize. <laughs> Um, but there is some significance to having that designated. And then obviously anything done to it have to go through the certificate of appropriateness. So it's just kind of a protection to keep the integrity of its historic value in place or what was listed in the application to get that designation. So there may be someone else on staff that can answer that better. My understanding is they do the validation, okay. mm -hmm. but the, but the uh, restrictions on, on the property itself would have to be done in agreement with the homeowner via the deed or some co extra covenants that are that are added to it. Uh, the Historic Preservation Committee can't arbitrarily put covenants on property without that being worked through it at the deed level. I actually have a question for you, Steve. Um, you list that this that you review or, or update your rules and procedures. Wouldn't that be this board's job to do the lower committee's rules and procedures? So what each committee does is they update it and then and that's something we'll discuss when we get together. But then they give us what they recommend as changes and then we bring, okay. bring them all together. Gotcha. Kind of thing. Thank you. So as a for instance, just and thank you for doing this, they asked for some advice and counsel on closed session. Yes, thank okay? you. Okay, and, and so now you're gonna put that in, in your procedure that it's right. not it's not allowed, but we gave them the, the, yes. the guidance on that. So right. and thank you for doing that. Well thank you, we appreciate that being in record. Just to do a reminder, we had done a reminder before, but just to make sure everyone felt good and it was <laughs> on the same page. So, did we accomplish the feel good, or did we just so. accomplish the communication? So, <laughs> we've got a meeting in a couple weeks, so we'll go over that very well. Yes. Did you have more questions? I, well, I mean, I, I don't know if she's able to answer at this time. But I just, I, I feel like I need more education on just historic preservation. There's a lot of misinformation out there so I didn't know if, if your committee is able to address that you know how we do we protect things is is it necessary to put any kind of protection on anything that type of that's kind of what I'm sure, more interested if, in. I mean I don't know if you have a specific recommendation but we'd be happy to come to some a meeting or give a presentation or so why don't we take that up next week when we meet as a board as to what we would want to do because there's an opportunity maybe to educate us but more importantly as importantly educate the community uh, at the same time and so we could maybe host a session and promote it um, etc because and that would be good it seems that there's always an ongoing need between property owners or just the community in general to know you know who has authority who can say what you can and can't do and a lot of those questions understandably so i think that would be good dialogue right. Um, as well as, you know, um, what are the benefits of historic preservation or, you know, um, how do you preserve that but at another risk? And weighing all of the benefits, you know, pros and cons to the community. So that would be great. That would be great. Okay. Um, and I'll direct this towards Greg, I think. Um, I'm assuming their social media presence would kind of be coordinated through yep. staff. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, okay. I assume, and I'll make sure that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very and much. Stay tuned. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, Ken, Main Street. How are you today, sir? Doing well, Steve. How are you? Good. 
So uh, first of all, guys, I would like to introduce myself. Um, if you don't know who I am, that's okay too. But um, my name is Ken Posco. I am a small business owner. I own Provisions Wax All right on Main Street. Um, I'm also a <coughs> Navy veteran, a uh, member of a, I'm a VFW life member, and I'm also a volunteer firefighter for the town of Wax. I have four kids and do a little other, a couple other things as well. So. So I just kind of wanted to come today and show you guys what we're working towards from the 2018-2019 work plan project. Um, there are just there's a few open-ended items that we're still working towards, um, but I want you guys to jump right on this. Um, one of the biggest things I think that we need to really recognize is that we have we are a recipient of the Great Main Street um, Award for in the state of North Carolina came down out of 64 different uh, main streets and only two were awarded we were one of them so that <clears throat> so this is actually quite a large accomplishment for us um, the Main Street Advisory Board we could not do it alone you know we did it with our businesses and reaching out and um, just proper channels uh, working with other folks to get this recognition um, this is something that we're actually going to throw together and try to get this out there as well to let people know that it doesn't do us any good if we already know it, but no one else does. So in an effort to th throw it together, using your words, um, we are having an announcement August 3rd or a, a promotion at Jammin' Up the Tracks at, at 645. And so there will be a whole campaign to make the town aware to come down and see it. And someone from the state is coming down to actually uh, present the award. So. So what we want to do is the Main Street, <clears throat> from an economic and historic preservation context, is kind of what we are doing to improve the Main Street flow of business while keeping its uh, unique characteristic. And in order to uh, for us to obtain that, we're working from a four-point approach. Uh, the organization um, is you know building the human and <clears throat> and the financial resources through the public and private partnerships to achieve a common vision. Um, the promotion, um, the design, and the economic restructuring, uh, strengthening existing economic assets, expanding and diversifying the economic base. Um, so as we are working with this four-prong approach, um, this is what, in order to be part of the Main Street um, organization, organization from the state we have to use their uh, four-prong approach um, so as of right now uh, the downtown impact we have 103 uh, businesses we have 152 full-time jobs uh, 40 per 45 percent of that is the restaurants that are located in downtown Waxhaw and then the other some 49 percent is the physical Waxhaw businesses that are located downtown as well um, that's a 13% gain from 2015 to 2018. Um, and this study was uh, th the results from January uh, study. So there was another one done this past June. We're waiting for all the numbers to come in and we'll be able to have more accurate numbers as well. Um, as far as the number of full-time jobs, net gain <coughs> is 25 from the 2015 2018 and that's in consideration with all of the new construction such as um, with the mill Emmett's um, P uh, Mary O'Neill's you know things like that different restaurants different businesses coming in uh, the rebranding of the barbecue restaurant also uh, brought you know new life to that side of the tracks as well um, so these are just the Main Street kind of boundaries this is the where we work um, kind of like our, our thought process and um, so it, it's kind of interesting because you see that it does reach down in many different areas um, many different neighborhoods and also you know it's finding um, you know a lot of different demographics as well um, here so the development according to the uh, North Carolina Main Street requirements is the economic visionary statement, uh, the four-prong approach, and then the three economic development strategies based on the vision statement. Um, 
which we'll get to at the very end of this um, presentation. Um, it just kind of shows you just the four-prong approach or an example thereof. So the economic vision statement, um, you guys I'm sure had an opportunity to read this, but uh, downtown Waxhaw is Union County's hub for a diverse retail shops, award-winning dining establishments, local artisans, culture, cultural events, its pedestrian friendly streets and beautifully preserved historic <clears throat> character provides residents and visitors alike with a sense of heritage, activities, and well being. So, me, myself, uh, my wife, as business owners, we actually hear this all the time. We always hear how, you know, Main Street, the downtown area, it really it looks like it hasn't changed in the history. And a lot of folks, especially the new people that are moving into town every single day, they're like, wow, they didn't know it was here. And it's, you know, just right out their front door. Um, and I think it, it really just adds to it that, you know, as we're going and we're building and more people coming in with the social media aspect, that we're letting people know about it as well. So strategy one is to create a network of pedestrian-friendly streets. Um, so we are going to, we're analyzing and updating the parking counts because parking is always an issue um, for downtown businesses and also um, just people in general, so. But I would suspect that that has changed significantly since the original study in 2016. Yes, sir. it has. Um, <clears throat> so we're also working on that study as well um, to get an update. Um, conduct the walk a walk audit in downtown to identify beautification opportunities. This goes from our light post to our trash cans to, you know, some of the uh, fencing that is around uh, Niven Price Building to right there on the corner of um, Main Street where it also, you know, just to make things look a little bit better, to make it more eye appealing. Uh, and to continue promoting the TAP brand and serving in the downtown stakeholder group for the project. So we are um, working right now. The design phase is 65% complete. Final design will be done in a, several, in a couple of months. Um, and then we go into the next stage, which is gonna be seeking construction bids. And with that being said, that uh, we do have a timeline, hopefully by spring, early summer, that the construction will start. Um, I, we had the deadline put in here for 2021 for the completion because what a lot of folks may not understand is that if we do not complete it by that time, we actually lose the TAP grant and all of its funding behind it. So the entire project has to be completed by that time frame. So. Yeah, I, perhaps uh, at, an, at a future meeting, not you, but maybe Kurt could come and, uh, and update us. They, they, they moved the funding around, um, and so, but that shouldn't have impacted the uh, the project, but at, at one point in time, a year ago, we said construction in 2018, then early 2019. I think to the community saying a completion in 2021, that's a head scratcher, and I think we need to kind of put the expectation of what's really getting done there so people are aware. Um, I get the funding aspect, other, um, uh, if, if everything isn't done, completed, dotted, everything, crossed. You name it, um, yeah. Then we don't get the money, but I'm guessing that we'll have a lot of work done before then, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I'll jump Ken, in. Ken's committing for everybody. This is good. I like. Yeah, absolutely. Like I'll jump. I'll jump in and like manage it if I need to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if in the next slide, you can see just a uh, few of the improvements we're looking forward to. Um, the big thing is addition of sidewalks and crosswalks. Uh, right now, as it stands, uh, we're going to. We're looking to put in uh, sidewalks that are going to be up um, on, by the railroad tracks so that people can actually walk on that side of the street. Um, adding um, handicap spots for handicap parking um, that will be actually properly used instead of in a bad spot where um, handicap personnel cannot um, commit to that as well. Um, one of the biggest things is <clears throat> on the east uh, Broom Street, North Broom Street, uh, we're looking to bump that sidewalk out and make that into a one lane road, uh, which will definitely cut down on the uh, congestion right there at the intersection, and also just allow that more of a, uh, a thoroughfare for people to walk, to dine, to listen to music, things of that nature. So, 
So we're looking to strategy number two is to foster a diverse mix of retail, eating, and drinking establishments. Um, we're going to spearhead a creation of regular downtown merchant meetings. Uh, we had our second one, which was yesterday. Um, <clears throat> so at the first meeting, we attracted 16 businesses in attendance, which was great. Uh, we weren't sure how many people were going to show up, who was going to show up, what kind of activity that we would have. Um, yesterday's meeting unfortunately only showed 10 people and 10 businesses um, we like to think that was because of, the, of it being weather related um, because with the storm obviously people they don't come out that much um, but what it does what we're doing with this is it allows businesses to communicate with each other express interest and then kind of take it from there it's um, you know and there is actually one of us from the board that does attend these meetings certainly not to be a um, an official representative of that but to just kind of take in what our businesses are saying around us um, so uh, serve as a downtown stakeholder during review of the town owned real estate to include collaborations with the park and rec advisory board review the original waterfall proposal on the corner lot um, I'm sure as you guys know there's a lot of people who think that we're actually putting in a waterfall um, however it is not um, so this is just uh, part of the town owned property um, if you see here one of the biggest things that we're working towards and also with the tap grant is from that corner lot that we have is to kind of make a, a big uh, loop so we have a starting point and the ending point is in the same exact location if you're coming up from the south side um, so we're looking to <clears throat> keep that as far as the Nivens price building the parking lot for access to stay in that loop as well these are just uh, rough examples of some town um, towns that actually have the um, drawings already done we do not have any architectural plans as of yet uh, but we're looking to make that corner lot a centerpiece um, for events okay whether it is a concert whether we move the farmers market down there whether you know at the time that we do a chef demonstration which I'm all about of course um, but basically to make people like when they see it they're they're excited about it um, and not have things hidden away um, such as like you know farmers market for instance if you don't know where exactly where it is it's very hard to find it I think your main point correct me if I'm wrong is we need to take advantage of that corner lot to promote downtown it's sitting sitting idle you say that's it so much better than me but that's yes, the sir. challenge that you're putting towards us that you'd like some help on to at least get the ball rolling because yes, it's sir. just an empty lot right. correct so we, let me ask you a question totally unrelated to this would it help if you had a consistent board member come into your meetings absolutely absolutely just you got a lot of information here that it's on you, you know it's hard and we'll digest it again next week when we get together but sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, just for just communication, I think it's very big and very important with us moving forward with so many project and projects and ideas that we have an ear to listen to, and um, also to get some feedback as well. Sorry, I didn't mean to take you off track. Go ahead. No, you, I, I'm, I don't have a track, Steve. Thank you, though. Um, <laughs> Strategy three to foster a cultural events, <clears throat> local artisans, and historic preservation context. Um, support uh, support Waxall events through development sponsorship um, with its vendors, improving uh, event strategies. Um, connect <clears throat> connect businesses with grant opportunities for such as facade grants um, and other items as well with um, historic tax credits side grants and the appropriate designs as well because a lot of folks have ideas of what they want to do but they can't do it because of the location of their business and their building so they have to you know get positive reinforcement from us to let them know that hey we stand behind you in your want and your need to improve the your business but this is what you have these are the guidelines in which you have to follow This is a just a um, the template for our four points this is an example um, so the strategy one is again to create a network of pedestrian friendly streets that's this is just like I said just an example 
uh, we have this available. I'm sure you guys have already seen it. Um, <clears throat> but talking about the TAP grant, the organization, the promotion, design, and then the economic vitality of it, and it breaks it down. So this is what we work towards every month. You know, obviously having a starting, middle, and end, and then this is where we go, and then we just kind of build on this, and we make changes as we go. Um, and this is just a great picture of our Kaleidoscope Festival, um, you know, with the food trucks, everybody sitting down family style, you know, just eating and just kind of, this is kind of where we, um, we've always been. We've always been a family. We've always been a group of folks that have a great hospitality, and, you know, just we want to build on that. Other questions for Ken? Can you explain the waterfall thing a little bit more? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, the name waterfall actually came from, uh, I believe it was um, not Stanley, maybe Stanley County, but it's the waterfall approach in the thought process is a center point of the downtown area. And what it's going to do is some, some folks have, um, you know, artscapes, larger points, such as uh, was down to Rock Hill for a food truck Friday, and they have a very nice waterfall there, which is just kind of like a, a center area for entertaining and um, gathering. Uh, but we're, we're, our idea is to build upon that and have it work all the way around the downtown area, and not just one central location, so all businesses can take advantage of that. One that promotes that very uh, energetically is um, Greenville, South Carolina. If you go down there, you you can't help but see where everything emanates from. So, yes, sir. Well, thank you very much. This has been very informative. Like I said, we're getting together as a board within a week or two on all the boards and committees, um, and so um, I really do appreciate you coming and taking time. Yes, sir. And, and uh, sharing this with us. So, thank you. Absolutely. See you guys at provisions. Send me the soup menu, please. Yes, <laughs> All right, that's it for the, the work session. So uh, we'll at this point adjourn until uh, 6.30 for the regular meeting.